This program is brought to you by Emory University. I have this magic, uh, wondrous Indonesian uh, pin that uh, when you drop, it makes a beautiful, beautiful musical sound. Right? Have you ever heard this, uh, this pin drop? Right? Okay, I'm, I'm, you're going to listen, right? Ready? Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's my innovation on how to get people to listen to you at the beginning of your speech. So I didn't have to do the moonwalk. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I guarantee you that introduction by Jeff and by Fifi is a lot better than my speech. So, uh, and, uh, you know, Fifi mentioned about uh, this uh, strategic institute in Jordan who named me the, uh, what are called the 500 most influential Muslims. And there's a good story that my staff came to me one day and said, Ambassador, there's good news. What is it? This Royal Strategic Studies in Jordan said that you are one of the top 500 in most influential Muslims in the world. That's good news. What's the bad news? You're number 500. <laughs> I want to, I wanna, uh, again, uh, recognize uh, some, some uh, distinguished people. First, of course, I want to say uh, thank you for, to Emory University for your uh, friendship and cooperation and for looking after Indonesian students. Jeff, I know you have a lot of Indonesian students. Holly, thank you so much. You've been so active in promoting our relations. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Wagner also, who, who's not here, but please uh, uh, convey my best regards, Jack this, and of course, Fifi and Robert, uh, who's been uh, a champion, uh, Indonesian diaspora in this community, and, and we value uh, their, their work and service very much, so, so thank you very much. Uh, also, I want to recognize, again, uh, the Secretary General of Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, Marsudi Shuhud, thank you for being here. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a heroine uh, tonight. Uh, this is the uh, CNN heroine. Uh, I'm not kidding about this. Uh, uh, she actually used her knowledge from studies in the U.S. to go back to Indonesia and produce what is called independent hydro energy independent villages uh, throughout Indonesia. Uh, these are villages that use uh, te water technology and they become energy independent. Uh, now there are dozens of them and then now she's even uh, implying this technology in Africa and throughout Asia. Uh, Tri Mumpuni, please stand up. Good. Uh, another special friend, uh, somebody who's been very active in highlighting the profile of Asian Americans uh, in the United States uh, through uh, what is known as the Who's Who uh, of Asian American Alliance. Uh, very, very uh, uh, active uh, group of uh, people under the leadership of Sachi Koto. Can I ask you to stand up, Sachi? Yeah. And I want to introduce a special friend. Uh, this is uh, my college friend. Uh, before I ask him to stand up, uh, uh, he actually, Probably uh, I'm here a little bit because of him, because I almost failed English in school, and he helped me, uh, what do you call it, pass uh, English. And uh, we spent a lot of time, two summers in New York. He was my best friend. Uh, we ha were hanging out in Jones Beach, and you know, one day, because I was not doing well in school, for almost failing English, you know, we were asking, you know, what's going to be, you know, what's going to happen to us, you know? And you know, we just didn't realize uh, what the future would hold. Uh, f uh, for us, but uh, he's been uh, a great friend. And I remember just before I left uh, New York, uh, you know, he said to me, Do you know, if you ever need a job one day, you know, give me a call. Maybe I have a better luck than you, you know. So that's Michael. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the topic of my talk today is emerging powers uh, in, 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 in the world. And I think. Uh, Michael asked me, uh, what is the difference between today and our time uh, before? I think one difference is before, uh, in 19, uh, early 80s, me and my third world friends, you know, the Pakistanis, the Koreans, uh, and the Bangladeshis, uh, we used to try to fake American accents, right? <laughs> Remember those days, right? And used to make fun of us, right? Uh, and now, because the world has changed, you know, when I go to the State Department today, my American diplomats try to fake an Indian accent and, <laughs> and Vietnamese accent and Korean accent. So that, probably that's how the world has changed. Right? Good. Look, uh, I want to talk today about 
uh, emerging powers. And, and I want to begin by talking about a concept that has sort of died down and disappeared for a while, but has come back to the fore. Right? Uh, and this term is called revolution. Right? Now, Indonesians love this term because we are a country which were born out of a revolution. And I know Americans also like this term because, hey, American Revolution changed the world uh, in 1776. But we haven't heard, uh, at least on my part, this term being said or heard uh, in, in about uh, a decade or so. You know, uh, uh, it just got lost. But uh, more recently, we are beginning more and more people talk about revolutions, but in a different way. Uh, uh, we hear about the Arab Spring revolutions, which is still going on, and we hope that it will go in the right uh, directions. Uh, in Indonesia, we hear about what is called the Quiet Revolution. Uh, this is when we changed the law, so we made sure that every political leader would be directly elected by the people, and this turned the political pyramid upside down. Right? Uh, we hear about the IT revolutions, uh, which we know are changing the way societies live, play, and uh, function. Uh, we hear about the green revolution. Uh, and we think, we hear about so many different kinds of revolutions in different contexts, but basically it all has the same meaning. Uh, it's an event that is changing the life uh, and shape of uh, a nation. It's a transformational uh, event. And what is interesting is that uh, when you talk about emerging powers, uh, you are seeing actually the effect of these 21st century revolutions. Right? Now, the 21st century revolutions are very different than 20th century uh, revolutions. 20th century revolutions, like the one that happened in Indonesia, was violent. Right? Uh, but 21st century revolutions, most of them are silent. Not all, but most of them are silent. 20th century revolutions brought freedom, uh, freedom from colonialism, and created um, a lot of independent states uh, around the world. The 21st century revolutions created middle class. Uh, Indonesia, for example, has the largest middle class in Southeast Asia and the fastest growing middle class also in Southeast Asia and in our uh, history. 20th century revolutions, you saw a lot of coup d'etats, you know, uh, including in Indonesia. Right? Well, maybe not in Indonesia, but in, in other places you see coup d'etats after coup d'etats. Uh, by the military in Asia, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and in uh, uh, Africa. 21st century revolutions, uh, you don't see much good data. You see the growth of civil societies. Uh, you see uh, societies developing systems uh, that became more important than personalities. 20th century revolutions brought sovereignty to nations because that's what the whole uh, battle is all about, is how to uh, eject colonialism and become independent states, independent and sovereign states. 21st century revolutions is about not sovereignty, but connectivity. 20th century revolutions brought equality among citizens, people who were oppressed before, people who did not have rights, and now suddenly they had rights after they became independent. But 21st century revolutions brought not just equality, but an explosion of opportunity and wealth. 20th century revolution is about liberation. 21st century revolution is about transformation and elevation. 20th century revolutions brought uneasy bipolarity. You know, my generation, your generation, had to live with this bipolarity, East and West, uh, which in the end crumbled in early 1990s. 20th century revolutions, uh, well, it brought unprecedented stable peace among the major powers. You know, the relations between America, Russia, China, Japan, and Europe uh, is now relatively stable. Uh, and it's uh, hard to think of a time in the past that we uh, experienced this. And 27, 20, 20th century revolutions brought, brought uh, the, what is called the third world nations. Yeah. And to be honest, I didn't like that term, Jeff. Why? Because it presupposed if you're in a train, you have first class passengers, you have second class passengers, and you have third class passengers. And we were, because we were third world, third class passengers. So, you know, I, I, I was never really comfortable with that. But 21st century revolutions brought emerging economies, emerging nations, and we're much more 
comfortable uh, with uh, that term. You know, it brought uh, the G20, the, the next 11, as they call it, uh, Chivats, uh, you know, the three Gs, the global growth generators, and other terms, but basically uh, is uh, something positive about the shifting uh, uh, nature of the uh, international system. So these are the 21st century revolutions that we are seeing now. You know, it's less romantic, less dramatic, uh, but the impact, I would say, is even more powerful than 20th century revolutions. I mean, did you know between the year 2000 and 2006, six years, an average of one million people were lifted out of poverty a week in Asia, right? Right? I mean, did you know that South Korea, Japan, China, and Singapore doubled their economy, right, within a decade, right? And some, including China, doubled it again. I mean, this is remarkable because I think there's a great paper by the Australians on this. Uh, it took Britain 50 years to double its economy during the Industrial uh, Revolution. And so uh, this 21st century revolution is remarkable in terms of if its impact and is enormously powerful in terms of its ability to transform the lives of nations. And I think what is interesting is that these 21st century revolutions is breaking myth and stereotypes. What myth and stereotypes? Some are imposed by others to us, and some are imposed by us to us. You know, our own uh, internally built system of myth and stereotypes. Now, what am I talking about? Indonesia, for example, we broke the myth that you cannot have development and democracy at the same time. You know, in the 60s, this is the competing schools I thought you could either have a lot of democracy, right, but little development, right, uh, or you have a lot of development, a lot of growth like Indonesia had in the 70s and 80s, but little democracy at the expense of freedom, right? And for so many years, the Asians were debating this. Which one was right? You know, we couldn't have both. Which one do you want to choose? Indonesia broke that. They said we could have both, right? In the last 12 years, we have now the highest, second highest economy in Asia after China. Not many people know this. We now have surpassed India uh, to be the second highest growth economy. And at the same time, we're the most stable and strongest democracy in Southeast Asia, which proved that, hey, we can have both democracy and uh, uh, development, right? China broke the myth. What is the myth? The myth that communist state cannot be a real economic superpower. Because, you know, we saw the Soviet Union was a superpower, right? But it was never really an economic superpower. It was bankrupt for so many years and until it crumbled uh, in, in the end. Uh, Vietnam, again, broke the myth. I don't know if we are anybody from Vietnam, but uh, we thought when Vietnam won the war in, in, in 1976, we thought they're probably the most formidable military force in the world. But can they be an economic warrior? Can they be successful in the economy, uh, uh, what they did in the military side? Yes, they could, right? Uh, Vietnam is now one of the best performing economies in uh, uh, Asia. And many societies and economies in Asia are breaking the myth that it would take generations to catch up with the West. You know, uh, when our founding fathers framed the Constitution, we thought that it would take five or six generations to catch up with the West, right? But the reality is that there are pockets or economies or societies, Singapore, Shenzhen, um, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, that has not just catch up, but sometimes even leapfrog uh, economic developments and social and technological achievements uh, in the West in one generation, in one generation. I mean, Shenzhen 30 years ago was just a small fishing village of 200,000 people, right? You go there now, it's a bustling metropolitan city of, what is it, 15 million people, one of the highest growth cities in China in just one generation, right? Cambodia, you look at a, uh, about a decade ago in the 70s, they had a genocide, a million people died, one of the most impoverished uh, country in Asia. I was just returning from Cambodia, uh, Cambodia about a week ago when they held the East Asia Summit, and it's just a bustling uh, country with bright uh, economic uh, prospects. Singapore broke the myth 
that a small island with no natural resources whatsoever and even no nationalism, because you know all these people were immigrants. You know they had no flag, no national anthem, right? They they didn't even want to be a country until Malaysia ejected them, and they had to be a country, right? Because they had no other choice, right? But uh, Singapore broke the myth that a country with no natural resources can be actually uh, one of the most developed economies in the world, not just in uh, Asia. Malaysia also broke the myth. You know, Malaysia broke the myth about being Malays. You know, James know, know about this, you know, Indonesians are also Malays, Bruneans Malays, uh, Malaysian Malays, and we love to make fun of each other, of, 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 you know, of being Malays, because Malays is known to be, what is it, you know, yeah, lazy, uh, allergic to modernity, and, you know, uh, things like that, you know. That was the myth. When I was studying here in 1979, this is what we always make fun of another Malay, you know, uh, who could never compete, and so on and so on. But now, you know, Malaysia is, uh, again, an uh, industrial nation. Its trade is much larger than, than uh, its GDP. And it proved that the Malay economy can be very competitive and can be uh, very developed. Uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, what did they prove? They proved that innovation can grow in Asia, in emerging economies. You know, we thought, hey, you know, innovation, this all belongs to the West, right? This is what we really thought, you know? This is what we grew, what we grew up thinking, right? Uh, it couldn't belong to us, you know? We had just to follow and copy them, right? But what happened is the other way. Now, uh, Taiwan, Korea, China, uh, Singapore especially, uh, they are developing not just the present technology, but they're developing their niche in the next generation of uh, uh, technologies. Hong Kong, it broke, the myth, it broke the myth that Asian societies are corrupt. Yes, many other Asian societies are corrupt, but you know what Hong Kong did for its own? Hong Kong turned itself from one of the most corrupt economies in Asia, and within 15 years, one generation became one of the cleanest economies in Asia. 15 years, right? So you had all these countries breaking down myth and stereotypes that they created from themselves or other people created for themselves, right? It's, it's quite remarkable, this change of mindset uh, that took place in Asia and uh, across the uh, emerging economies. What is the impact? So this, this myth were being erased, stereotypes were being beaten up, right? Set aside, what is the impact? The impact is the rise of confidence, right? Now you ask me what is the most important thing to a country, like to China, what is the most impress impressive thing it's not the numbers. It's not the fact that their economy doubled in 10 years between 78 to 88 and doubled again 88 to 98. No, these are just numbers and statistics. What was most interesting and what was most powerful is in the late 70s, the Chinese had a different mindset. They changed their whole outlook of themselves and how China should function in the world, right? And they developed this thing called confidence. Right? And I tell you, uh, it's not the technology that matters, it's the mindset that creates this technology and innovation. If you are confident, you can do anything in the world. You can achieve anything in the world. If you don't have the confidence, you're going to lose. You are a loser before you even compete. Right? And you know what? Most Asians didn't have confidence. Honestly, as an Indonesian, the confidence that we have today, a recent Paul said that 85% of Indonesians, no matter what they think of the government and the parliament, and by the way, it's not very high, <laughs> they 85% believe that the country has the right system and is heading in the right direction. You know, that's a very high number. We've never had that state of mind uh, uh, before. Uh, there was a recent poll uh, taken, it was reported in The Economist, that Brazil, India, and China, uh, over 85 to 92% of the respondents uh, felt that the country uh, that, that this, uh, the country is heading in the right direction uh, as well. When I was in World Economic Forum recently, I met a Peruvian, and you know, I shared a cab with him, and he said that 10 years ago, 70% of Peruvians wanted to leave the country because of the, you know, the terrorism and, and the drugs and, and so on and so on. But today, 85% of them are proud of being uh, Peruvians. You know. So, so this, this confidence is very, powerful. Now, it's important to know, for you to know what this is not, 
right? Uh, uh, this confidence is different than when Premier Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union said many years ago to the West, we will bury you. That's not confidence, that's arrogance, right? Uh, it's different from when Mao Zedong uh, said to the world, if there's a nuclear war, we're gonna beat the West, we're gonna beat America because China has, a, uh, what is it, one billion people and in an event of nuclear war, we will lose only 300 million people and uh, you know, America will be wiped out. That's not confidence, that's madness, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, even Indonesia, we had our own version of being anti-West in the 60s, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, it's more historical, uh, and, uh, you know, resentment due to colonialism, and it's not confidence, right? So confidence is about, it's, it's not on the elite level, although it can be there, but it's more at the grassroots level, and it's about how you define yourself and how you glorify success and how you think you're an equal partner in the world and believing that you can compete with anybody and you can be as good as anybody, right? So that's what confidence is all about. There's a great report uh, by a French think tank uh, and it's, uh, I don't speak French, but it sounded like le fondation, innovation, politique, something like that, you know? Uh, but they did a survey. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did a survey of youth around the world and what they think about uh, globalization, about the environment, and so on. It's one of the most interesting reports that I've read. You know what they found? You know what country in the world has the largest number of youth who love globalization? Not just like or curious, who think globalization is part of their success and part a positive force for their future and brings a lot of uh, benefit. Can you, can you guess? No, China, 91%. You know what's the second? India, 89%. Brazil, 79%. South Africa, 76%. America, again, I don't know if you agree with this number, but I don't write this, right? <laughs> uh, 71%. Japan, 75%. France, 52%. Greece, 48%. <laughs> But, you know, Mao Zedong would roll over in his grave if he knew that 91% of Chinese youth love globalization. I mean, it's such a capitalist you know, thing to do, you know, to be, to be loving uh, globalization. But it reflects, again, a very fundamental shift in mindset of the society and particularly in the youth and how they see the world. And this confidence, therefore, is not just internal, yeah? It's, this confidence is also external, right? And this confidence is not just economic confidence, right? But this confidence is also political confidence, is cultural and also diplomatic confidence. And the confidence is not just about the present. This confidence is about the future. And this confidence is happening despite the fact that in many of the countries of these countries, you have poverty still in their societies. In Indonesia, you know, we have uh, 45, 50 million people in poverty, in China also, in India, right? Despite all these things, they still feel the confidence. Whereas before, they would use this as a way to neglect and deflect and deny confidence to uh, their, 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 their mindset. And in most cases, countries that adopt or that develop this confidence, you know what happened? All of them begin by stopping being dogmatic and ideological. This is what the Chinese did, right? This is what the Indians did. They started opening up, right? Uh, they started thinking the world not as a threat, but at a, as an opportunity. You Americans know this, you're an expert uh, on, 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 on this, right? Uh, and in most cases, they become less conspiracy conspiratorial. Is that how you say it? Conspiratorial in their thinking, you know? They start blaming others for faults and they start looking into themselves. And they start seeing threats to their future not as coming from the outside, not an invading army, not an imperialist army, not a colonial colonialism, but they start saying to themselves the threats to our well being is mostly internal. You know, ignorance, extremism, radicalism, corruption, mismanagement, separatism, internal conflict, which are 90% internal, right? So again, 
by changing the way they look at themselves, the nature of the world that they face, and how they could fit in, they develop this uh, 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 confidence. Right? And this is what is creating uh, the emerging powers that we see uh, around uh, the world. Uh, most, to most of these emerging powers, uh, they believe that the past no longer imprisons them. Right? They believe that the size and population are no longer a burden. We used to think that, you know, we used to think, oh, Indonesia is like 200 million people, they're all poor, uneducated, what to do, you know, what to do? But now, hey, Indonesia, largest middle class in Southeast Asia, a lot of wealth, a lot of uh, skilled workers, a lot of uh, doctors, a lot of lawyers, a lot of opportunities, right? So we changed the way uh, we see ourselves. Uh, we started believing that our resources are not a curse, right? Before we used to think, hey, you know, if you have oil or something, that's a curse because it makes you lazy. It doesn't make you want to do, you know, innovate and, and change. Uh, but now more and more, our resources are one of the factors for strong development. We see our economy not as belonging to the past, but as uh, economy for the future and an asset for the 21st century. We see our culture. We used to make fun of our culture, saying, oh, Indonesians are too this, too that. Uh, but we believe that our culture now is a source of success. This is what the Chinese are saying. You know, look, Confucianism is our values that will bring success to us. Indonesians also uh, uh, see that. And we see our future filled with hope and with, with hope and optimism. So this is what you see this confidence is bringing to uh, the emerging world. Now, I'm not saying that things are perfect, right? Things are not uh, perfect, right? Uh, we don't live in a perfect world. But what I see is that in most of the countries, including in Indonesia, our future it is, is defined no longer by our problems, but by our prospects and by our progress. And that makes a lot uh, of, 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 of difference. Now, what does this mean to America? I've spoken too long about this, but I want to uh, try to uh, try to bring you to the question of what does this mean for uh, America. Uh, in many of these emerging economies, the one thing that I hope will not happen, and America also should try to see that it doesn't happen, is for this confidence to feed into a sense of angry nationalism. It can easily go that way. I'm so glad Indonesia has not gone that way. I'm so glad China has not gone that way, right? Although in their fight with Japan, sometimes you see a little bit of that, right? I'm so glad it hasn't happened in South Korea. I'm so glad it hasn't happened in India or Brazil or South Africa. But the potential for this confidence to become cocky and to become arrogant form of nationalism, to believe that we are better than you, and you colonize us, and now payback time. You know, you see this in Venezuela, right? You see this in some other country. The potential is there. It hasn't happened, and we hope it will not happen, right? And this is why we formed the, this movement in Indonesia, the modernizers, to make sure that the, the nationalism that Indonesia embraced remains open, moderate, and tolerant, and pluralistic, right? And America should also know, I know when I come here, America always talks about American exceptionalism, right? It's very important to you. It's part of your nationalism. It's part of your national ethos. And what you should know is the more these emerging powers grow, China, India, and they become not just rising powers, but established powers, they too will develop their own sense of exceptionalism, right? It's inevitable, right? With economic cloud comes what? Entitlement. Right? So you will need to get used to that as well, just as much as we have tried to get used to American sense of exceptionalism. Now, you know, it will take a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of diplomatic, uh, you know, uh, outreach and, and understanding for all of us to recalibrate, recalibrate to this new real reality. But uh, believe me, Lee Kuan Yew is right in saying this. China does not want to be America. China does not want to be Britain, does not want to be Canada. China wants to be China. 
Indonesia wants to be Indonesia. India does not want to be Britain, even though uh, now Tata is the largest British industrial <laughs> employer and buying up all, yeah? <laughs> India wants to be India, right? So uh, I think this is what we need to get used to uh, as we observe the new uh, international system. And it also means this. Look, in 1945, America won the war. And you could dictate and shape the world system according to your terms, right? Which is mostly what happened, right? Uh, and the, the United Nations is mostly an American, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, yeah, American product. You know, your great ideals gave life to the UN system. And what happened in the end of the Cold War, when the Berlin Wall crumbled, right, and the Paris Treaty, same thing happened. You felt that you could shape the world according to your terms, right? And of course, the whole world felt that way as well. What happens now? It doesn't work that way. With China, with India, with all these emerging powers, even though they're not a collective bloc, but they're all saying, look, we want a stake in the international order and we don't want to be taken for granted because we have our own interests. They will say, hey, we have our terms too. So the secret to a more stable world in the 21st century is how America and the emerging powers, including China, including India, can come to mutual terms. And finding this medium point and how they find it is going to be the defining question of uh, our time. And Americans, I think, should also be proud when you see the rise of India, the rise of Indonesia, the rise of Chile, Brazil, South Africa. You know why? Because they're part of you. You know, I'm ambassador here. I was educated here. <laughs> My president went to Webster University, right? And that experience gave him the chance to promote military reforms even before democracy uh, came about. Our economic ministers, the lineup, were all educated uh, in America. Our success is your success, right? So I think America should be happy and proud to see all these nations rise up. Uh, many of them uh, were invested in uh, uh, America, right? Now, uh, it doesn't mean that you have it easy now. Now, what do I mean by it? Uh, look, uh, you know, America is known as the land of freedom and opportunity. Right? You want to keep it that way in the 21st century. What you don't want is America to be known as a land of freedom, and China is the land of opportunity, and <laughs> India as a land of opportunity. Am I correct in this? Right? You still want to keep this going in the 21st century. And the game has changed so much. The game has changed so much. Uh, the, uh, look, if you look at the uh, countries that will be the biggest economies, in the, I, I forget the dates, is it 2025 or 2030, right? Uh, four, out of five, four out of five biggest economies in the world will be in Asia, right? Uh, China, uh, India, Japan, uh, I forget who for, is it Korea or something? Yeah, uh, and then the United States in the top five, right? But four out of five will be uh, in Asia. And we were talking about this today, that uh, America's economic space now it's relatively, what do you call it, declining uh, relative to China's economic space. I, I was saying that 20 years ago, China was nowhere to be seen as a trading partner, right? And America, Japan, and Europe was our num top three trading partners. But now, Ameri Indonesia's trade with America is 26 billion, with China is over 60 billion, right? And you see a similar pattern throughout Asia, right? Now, again, it's not a win-lose situation, but I'm just saying you need to get out of the comfort zone if you are going to win again in the new world of emerging powers in the 21st century. And I think if Americans, you know, election is behind you now, right? Now you have another four years of statesmanship and, and, and uh, so on and so on. If you become less, less compassionate nation as you were before, if you become more afraid of globalization, right? If you become less competitive and less able to reinvent yourself, right? Then you should worry. Because what got all these emerging powers up 
and running to be where they are now is because they got scared and they got off out of their comfort zone. They took risks and they had the courage to change. And America has always been very good at that, has always been very good at that. You just need to get out of your comfort zone. And as the last word, if you ask me what is the best analogy for America and the world, it's not football. You know, what do you call it? Football, right? Football. Yeah. You know why? When it comes to football, America is the best. Because it's only you who play it. <laughs> you know what is, the, what is the better analogy? Soccer. Everybody plays it. The Brazilians are good. The Indonesians not so good. The Koreans are excellent. Right? The Chinese are getting much better at it. Right? The South Africans, the Africans, the Nigerians, the British, the Russians, they all are great at the soccer. They have equal skills, and it's a flat, what do you call it, playing field. It's where America does not have a natural advantage. It's just like the world in the 21st century now. You know, you are ahead in many things, but you need to compete again, right? So when you see the world, don't think football, right? Think of this great game of soccer where you need to compete against everybody else, and if you win, you will have to earn that again. So that way, you can claim the 21st century is indeed the American century. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.